what we're going to do is uh, do some problems from chapter seven. Uh, here's number 20. Let me clean my glasses off here. So here we're going to use the outbound principle um, to determine the filling order. Now this is not my preferred filling order. My filling order is to use the SPDF uh, method and that's what I teach. And the SPDF method is based on uh, the blocks. So this is 1S all the way to 7S. This is 3D all the way down to 6D. This is 2P all the way down to 7D or 7P, excuse me. And this is 4F down to 5F. Okay, so I use the, the block notation and that's probably better, but the alcohol principle simply says you can use N and L to determine which orbital fills first. And uh, for the alcohol, you uh, fill N plus L uh, small first. And then if uh, the sum of N plus L is the same, then you fill the lower N first. So let's take a look at uh, 4F versus 5D versus 6S to see which is going to fill first. So we need to look at N and we need to look at L. So N is four when you have a four F, N is five when you have a five D, and uh, N is six when you have a six S. To figure out what L is, you have to remember that SPDF, numerically, these values are zero, one, two, three. So a four F, F is three, so our total is seven. 5D, D is two, so our total is seven. And 6S, P, uh, S is zero, so our total is six. So we're gonna fill in the 6S before we fill in the uh, here. And here we're gonna fill in the 4F before we fill in the 5D. So that's the order in which we would fill them. Uh, there are some problems with this, of course, because you put one electron into the 5D before you put them into the 4F. So I don't like to use the alpha principle, but this is the idea behind it. <clears throat> okay, using orbital box diagrams, depict an electron configuration for each of the following ions. So A for sodium, what you do first of all, for each one of these ions that are cations, you start off with a neutral atom. So a neutral sodium atom, if we look at a periodic table, the preceding element, uh, noble gas element, actually they don't say noble gas, so we're just gonna go with an orbital box diagram. So we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Okay. So we want an orbital box diagram. And that means we have one S and two electrons in there, one up, one down. We have a two S, one up, one down. And the two P has three orbitals. So here are three orbitals. And we put six in here, one up, one up, one up, uh, that's a, uh, Hun's rule, you put one into each orbital first when they're all the same energy, which means they're all from the same subshell. And then you put one down. And then we have the 3S. So there's neutral sodium. So what would sodium ion look like? Well, for sodium atom to become a sodium cation, you have to lose an electron. So Sodium ion would look like this, 1s, 2s, 
in 2P. One up, one up, one up, one down, one down, one down. Now, why is it that we only put two electrons in per orbital? Uh, and the answer is because of the Pauli exclusion principle that says that each of these particular electrons uh, can have, or each of these atoms or ions, um, every electron must have a unique set of quantum numbers. Okay, so that's A. Now for B, uh, we're looking at aluminum. And aluminum is also in the uh, third period like sodium. So for B, we have aluminum three plus. So let's look at aluminum neutral first. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Now, naturally, for this to become a plus three, we have to lose three electrons. And those three electrons are going to be these three right here. You always take the least stable first. So aluminum three plus is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, which means that this is going to look just like the sodium cation. In other words, it will look like this. 1s2, 2s2, and 2p. We're going to put six into here. So one up, one up, one up. And then one down, one down, one down. Okay, so that's the aluminum cation. C, we're going to do the germanium cation. So the germanium cation, uh, we can see that it is right here in group 4A, and they say that this is going to have a, uh, whoops, <clears throat> that it's going to have a plus two charge. So neutral germanium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and then 4p2. So that's the electron configuration to start with using the SPDF method. And again, we get this just by reading across the periodic table. So here's germanium right here. So when we read across the periodic table, we start here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and then 4p2. Uh, because remember, this is 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, all the way down. This is 3d, 4d, 5d. Over here, this is 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, 6p, and on down. And down here, this is 4f all the way across, and then this is 5f. You have to all, uh, remember that for the 4F and the 5F, they begin with cerium and thorium, and they end with lutidium and laurentium. So the periodic table I'm going to give you on the test is going to reflect that. There are some periodic tables that are kind of arranged differently. And you'll see lanthanum and actinium down here as part of this group. And then you'll see lutidium and laurentium up here as part of this group. And that's not quite correct. So I'll give you the periodic table based on what, how I want you to look at uh, SPDF notations. All right, so that's germanium. However, once we get this, we have to rearrange this. So my little symbol for rearrangement is this uh, pigtail with the arrow. So neutral germanium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10. So you put all the third shell subshells before all of the fourth shell subshells. So 4s2 and then 4p2. So this is germanium neutral. And what would germanium with a plus two look like? 
Well, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, 4s2. Now, all of this right here is the same electron configuration as argon. If you count up electrons 2, 4, 10, 18, and you look here at argon, argon has the atomic number of 18. Well, the noble gas configuration, we would write this argon, because this is the same as argon. And then we would write 3D10, 4S2. And so I'm going to write the noble uh, gas orbital box diagram for germanium plus two. And that's going to look like this. Argon. D has five orbitals. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's our 3D. And then here's our 4S with two in there. And so that would be germanium with a plus two charge. Now we also have to do F minus. So for F minus, what do you generally do for anions? In general, the anion electron configuration is the same as the neutral noble gas in the same period. So for fluorine, it would be 1s, for fluoride, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, because that's the same as argon. And if you look at F versus F minus, F has an atomic number of nine, F minus has an atomic number of nine. The number of electrons is equal to nine, because it's got to be neutral for F. And here, the number of electrons has to be 10 because you're gonna have a negative charge that's due to an extra electron. So how will 10 ar electrons arrange themselves in the subshells? It'll be just like argon, which has 10 electrons. So here, we've seen this before, 1s2, 2s2, and 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And in fact, this is the electron configuration for F minus. It's the electron configuration for O2 minus. It's the electron configuration for N3 minus. And so here, this kind of explains why uh, these particular ions exist is because they end up having an electron configuration like a noble gas, which means that they're kind of stable like a noble gas. They're not quite as stable as a noble gas because they're charged and therefore attracted to cations, whereas noble gases are not. Okay, so that's number 22. All right, let's look at number 24. Using orbital box diagrams and noble gas notation, depict the electron configurations of titanium, titanium two plus and titanium four plus. Is the element of any of these uh, ions paramagnetic and paramagnetic means that it's attracted to the poles of a magnet. And the way you determine that is if you have unpaired electrons. So let's look at titanium. Now it says orbital box diagram and noble gas notation. So that means we're starting with the noble gas. So here's titanium in our book. And if you look at the preceding noble gas, it's going to be a number smaller than 22, but hopefully close to it. And you can see that's gonna be argon. So we're gonna start with argon. And then to get to titanium, this where my thumb is, is 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s. So you see potassium is number 19, which is what we want to start with after argon. This is 4s2, because you go two across here. And then to get titan titanium, this is 3D, so you go one, two, two into the 3D. So it's gonna be argon, 4S2, 3D, 
two. Now, of course, this is not correct because we have to rearrange and put them in order of stability going from most stable to least stable. And threes are less stable than fours. So I'm gonna do my little pigtail and I'm gonna do argon 3D2, 4S2. So this is neutral titanium and this is A. So what is B gonna be for titanium plus two? Well, we can go straight to the, uh, uh, actually, I need to put the box notation. So I'm not quite done here. So 3D, we have five orbitals. And when we put the electrons in, according to Hund's rule, you put them, when they're in the same subshell, you put them into one orbital first, each before you pair them. So we would have to have five electrons in here before we could start to pair them with the sixth one. Okay, and then here is the four S, you put two in there like that. So this is the noble gas configuration. And this one is paramagnetic because we have two unpaired electrons. Now, what would titanium plus two look like? Well, it would look like argon, 3D, one, two. To get a plus two charge, we have to take away two electrons. We take away the two least stable, which are these to the far right. Now, what would titanium plus four look like? Well, it would look like argon. And since we arrived to this from here, this is gonna be okay, but normally we don't write the electron configuration out like this. This should really be neon 3s2, 3p6, which would make it neon 3s up, down, 3p up, 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 down, down, down. So this one is diamagnetic. And the reason this is diamagnetic is because all the electrons are paired and this one is paramagnetic because we have two unpaired. This one is also paramagnetic. Okay, so here I'm gonna put a little P here, a little P here and a little D here for para, para, para. So that means that if you have a, a uh, compound that has pure titanium in it, it will be attracted to a magnet. If you have a compound with titanium plus two ion, it'll be attracted to a magnet. But if you have a compound with titanium four, it won't be attracted to the magnet due to the titanium in there. Okay, so let's put this one off to the side. One compound uh, found in alkaline batteries is this NiOOH, a compound containing sodium plus three ions, or excuse me, nickel plus three ions. So we can actually figure out what this guy is made out of. We know that it's nickel plus three. So whatever this is, it's gotta have a minus three charge total. Now, what makes sense here? We've never seen a anion like this, a polyatomic anion. More than likely, this is probably an O2 minus and an OH minus, and we've seen both of those before. These add up to a negative three. So this is an interesting compound because it has two separate anions, which uh, we haven't seen before. Okay, so they say that uh, while the battery is working, the nickel plus three is reduced to nickel plus two. Use an orbital box diagram and the noble gas notation to show electron configurations of these ions. So these, that's these two right here are either paramagnetic. So we're gonna start with nickel and nickel is right here in period four. So we're gonna go back to period three to find the noble gas, which is argon. So we're gonna start with argon. And then to get to nickel, which is right here, we're gonna go 4S2. And what is the first D? It's 3D, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Nickel is the eighth element in the 3D, so we're going to say 3D8. So argon, 4S2, 3D8. Then we're going to rearrange. And we're going to get argon, uh, 3D8, 4S2. And for the neutral sodium, the box notation is going to look like this. So remember, Hun's rule says put one electron into each orbital before you pair them in an orbital. One, two, three, four, five. Now we have three more to put in here. So now we're going to start pairing them. First one always goes in spin up, which is plus one half. And the second one always goes in spin down, which is minus one half. So here we have our eight electrons. And for us, we have two electrons to put in here, one up, one down. Okay, so this one here we can see is gonna be paramagnetic. Because we have two unpaired electrons. Now, if we look at nickel plus two, To take a neutral nickel atom and turn it into a plus two ion, you have to take away two electrons. And it's going to be these two because they're the least stable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this one is paramagnetic. OK, and then we have nickel plus three which is argon. Now the question here is which electron do we take? Um, and the answer is we take the least stable one. Well, which one is gonna be the least stable? And the answer is, well, when you have two electrons in an orbital, they're sharing the same space. And since they're both negatively charged, that leads to a slight instability. This electron here is unpaired, so it doesn't have that same instability or instability. So here, we're gonna take that paired electron and do this. Now, another way to approach this, of course, is say, well, you know, I need to take one of these electrons and instead of having eight, I now have seven. So now put seven in here. And you would put the seven in here the same way you would do this using Hun's rule, one per orbital before you pair them. So this is also paramagnetic. So remember, you can also look at that, say I have eight electrons to get to here, I have to take one away, that would be seven, and then put your seven in there. Okay, so uh, here's your answer for number 26. All right, 28, arrange the following elements in order of increasing size. Try doing it without looking at figure 7.5. Okay, so we wanna know where these elements are on the periodic table. So if I uh, draw my periodic table, calcium is gonna be right here. Okay, and then we need uh, rubidium and phosphorus. Rubidium is right here. And if I draw this across, and then draw this side over here. Let's see, we need phosphorus. Phosphorus is in the third period. So this is roughly where phosphorus is. It's a, almost halfway over. Okay, and we need to find germanium. Germanium is right here. And then lastly, we need strontium. And strontium is, uh, let's see, where is that?
strontium is a metal. So there it is, strontium. That's next to rubidium. Okay, so this shows you pretty much where everything is. And if we look at each of these in turn, let's take a look at their electron configurations. So phosphorus, starting with the noble gas, is going to be neon. Uh, one, two, three, three S two, three P six. Uh, calcium is going to be argon, four S two. Germanium is going to be argon, four S two, three D 10. Remember this is one S, this is three D, this is 2p. Okay, so germanium is going to be 3d10, and then it's the second element over, so it's going to be 4p2. We rearrange this, and we get argon, 3d10, 4s2, 4p6. And then for rubidium, the previous uh, element here is going to be krypton, I believe. Let me double check. So rubidium, it's going to be krypton, and this will be uh, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, so 5s1, and then strontium is going to be krypton 5s2. So the first thing you're going to do when you uh, decide uh, which one's going to be larger. So here, arrange in an order of increasing size. So we want to go from small size to large size. The first thing you're going to do for size is you're going to look at the outer most occupied shell. Because the larger the outermost occupied shell, the larger the atom. So here you can see that for phosphorus, uh, let's see, phosphorus, calcium, germanium, rubidium, and strontium, the outermost occupied shell is a three, a four, a four, a five, and a five. Okay, so we know that as far as large to small goes, our first shot is phosphorus will be smaller than calcium and germanium, which will be smaller than rubidium and strontium. So how do we decide if they're in the same period? And the answer is farther to the right, they're smaller. So here we would expect germanium to be smaller than calcium. And we would expect strontium to be smaller than rubidium. So this becomes phosphorus is smaller than now, who's smaller, calcium or germanium? Germanium. Who's smaller? Uh, oh, I got to put calcium here. And who's smaller, rubidium or strontium? Uh, strontium is smaller. So this would be the order of size without looking at the chart. This would be a correct answer, even if the chart says it's different. This is what we would expect. So the big question is why, do, why is strontium smaller when it has more electrons? And the answer is when you look at a, a rubidium versus a strontium, they both have things in the N equal five shell. And that kind of tells you how large this atom is. But when you look at uh, rubidium, rubidium has 37 protons, strontium has 38 protons. So when you have stuff out there in the fish shell, but you have more protons inside your nucleus, you can actually pull those electrons in a little bit. So overall, what's gonna happen is your 37, your 37 protons might be this, N equal five, but your 38 protons is gonna be like this, N equal five, where it pulls those electrons in a little closer. So here, this is a smaller radius. Okay, so when do we use the argument that uh, the smaller radius will be the one on the right? 
well, when this outermost shell is the same. Well, what if the outermost shell is different? Well, the answer is the larger the n, the larger the radius. Okay, so that's the answer to 28. Let's take a look at 30. Select the atom or ion in each pair that has the larger radius. So uh, we've actually done this. Uh, actually, we haven't done this. So let's look at cesium versus rubidium. Uh, here's cesium right here. So for A, which one's bigger? Cesium. Why? Well, because we know that cesium, uh, I'm going to have to go back and forth between this and another piece of paper. So here for rubidium, we already know that that's a argon one, two, three, four, five, argon five S one. So for A, uh, rubidium is argon five S one, cesium is going to be, what is that xenon? No, Krypton. Oh, I messed that up. This is Krypton 5S1. And cesium is going to be xenon 6S1. So which one is larger? We're going to say that the cesium is larger because uh, it has electrons in the sixth shell and the sixth shell is greater than the fifth shell so that's a b o2 minus or o now when you're comparing the same element the one with more electrons is larger so o2 is larger because it's the same element but has more electrons. So we use that argument when it's the same element, but we look just at the number of electrons. C, when we look at bromine, bromine, which is going to be uh, argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5, which we rearrange and get argon, 3D10, 4S2, 4P5. We see that the outermost is the fourth shell. Now, when we look at arsenic, arsenic is in the same period as bromine. So it's gonna be argon, 4S2, 3D10. But where it is in the... Uh, 4P, you can see arsenic is 1, 2, 3. It's 3 over. So it's going to be 4P3. And when we rearrange this, we're going to get argon, 3D10, 4S2, 4P3, which is also the fourth. So we have a fourth shell versus a fourth shell. Which one is going to be smaller? Well, now we need to look at the nucleus. So for bromine in the nucleus, we have 35 protons with a positive charge of plus 35. Arsenic on the other hand has, let's see, 33 protons. So who is going to be able to pull that fourth shell in closer? And the answer is the one that has a larger positive charge. So it'll be something like this, where we expect the bromine to be smaller than the uh, Than the arsenic. So here we're answering which one is larger. We're going to say arsenic because they have the same outermost occupied shell. But arsenic has fewer protons to pull the electrons in. 
Okay, so if they can't pull them in, it results in a larger size. Okay, so that's the answer to number 30 or the answers to number 30. All right, let's put that one off to the side. And let's look at number uh, 32. Arrange the following atoms in order of increasing ionization energy. So ionization energy is when you take an atom. So I'm gonna write IE for ionization energy. When you take an atom in the gas phase and you add energy and you take away an electron. So if you take away an electron from this guy, it's gonna be a plus charge now. And here's the electron that you've removed. So how do we know this has been removed from this, uh, uh, from this guy to make this? And the answer is, well, uh, because these two added together equal that. So this must have been on here before. Okay, this is the ionization energy. Okay, so that's in general what we're looking at. Now, when we look at lithium, potassium, or sodium, or nitrogen, this is what the reaction looks like. Lithium gas plus the ionization energy for lithium gives you lithium cation gas plus an electron. And you can do the same thing for potassium. You can see I got ahead of myself and I started writing lithium again. But uh, we're asking which one of these ionization energies is smaller and which one is larger? So how do you determine which is smaller and which is larger? And the answer is uh, to look at uh, ionization energies and compare them. The first thing you do is you look at what shell is it taken from? The more stable the shell, the harder it is to take and the, harder, the higher the ionization energy. And then what you do then is you look at subshells essentially. So let's take a look at these and then you can also look at paired versus unpaired. So let's look at lithium, which is 1s2, 2s1. Potassium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. Uh, carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And uh, nitrogen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So here, let's look at the box diagrams on each of these. So for lithium, it's going to be 1s2 and 2s1. For potassium, we're going to go ahead and say that we're going to start with, uh, let's see, we're going to start with argon. So argon. And that way we can just write the 4s1. And for carbon, we're going to go ahead and write out the 1s2, the 2s2, and the 2p. And then for nitrogen, we're going to write out the 1s2, the 2s2, and the 2p3. Okay, so I would say that the 4s has got to be the easiest because it's the farthest away. Now remember, you're gonna take the first electron, the easiest electron, so that means the one farthest to the right. So here, that's gonna be the easiest. So we're gonna say uh, potassium is going to have the smallest ionization energy. So what about all these other ones? They're all from the second shell. Uh, in general, uh, our guess is going to be for the second shell, uh, we're gonna be looking at the nucleus because the, usually the smaller the atom, the harder it is to take. So which one of these is the smallest? Well, this has three protons, this has six protons, and this has seven protons, okay? So that means that this one's gonna be the smallest. 
and this one's going to be the largest. So when you're trying to take away an electron, usually when it's farther away from the nucleus, it's easier. So we're going to put lithium here, and then we're going to put carbon, and then nitrogen. And that's the order we'd go with. So this is what I'd expect on the test. All right. Compare the elements, boron, aluminum, carbon, and silicon, which has the most metallic character? Well, that's a no brainer. Boron and silicon are both metalloids, which means they're metal-like. Carbon is a non-metal, so we're gonna say aluminum. Why? Because it is a metal. B, which has the largest atomic radius? Well, we gotta find out where these are on the periodic table relative to one another. So roughly speaking, if this is carbon, this is aluminum down here, and this is boron next to carbon, and silicon is right here underneath carbon. So which has the largest atomic radius? It's gotta be either silicon or aluminum because they're down in the uh, third period. Now remember, which one is gonna be larger here depends on the nucleus. So which one has a larger nucleus that will be smaller? And silicon has the larger nucleus. So aluminum is going to be larger than silicon. Now, what about these two? Which one's going to be larger? Well, boron, because it only has, what, five protons versus carbon's six. So carbon will be the smallest. Aluminum will be the largest. And our answer is aluminum has the largest radius. OK. Which has the most negative electron attachment enthalpy? So electron attachment enthalpy is where you take an atom in the gas phase and you actually uh, add an electron to it. Now what results is a anion. Now, when that happens, energy is released. And when energy is released, that means it's got a negative sign, it's exothermic. So we put the energy over here. And of course it's negative. And that's why we talk about the negative electron attachment enthalpy. This is the electron attachment enthalpy. Okay, so uh, which one is going to give the most uh, negative electron attachment enthalpy? And the answer really depends on this. If this is your atom, and this is the shell it ends up in, and your electron comes from infinity and ends up on the shell, it depends on what shell it ends up in. If it ends up in an n equal one shell, it'll give off more energy than if it ends up in an n equal two shell. So to be able to answer this for C, you have to take a look at the uh, elements here and look at their electron configuration and ask ourselves, where does it end up? So for boron, you've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. For carbon, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And for aluminum, it's one, uh, actually, I'm gonna start with the noble gas configuration. For aluminum, we're going to start with neon, and then we're going to have 3s2, 3p1, and silicon is going to be neon, 3s2, 3p2. And what's neat about this one is we can actually use the radius to decide. So here we said that aluminum is the largest, so that means the electron ends up here. Silicon is the next largest, so the electron ends up here. And then the next largest is boron. Now boron's quite a bit smaller. So the length of the arrow is the size of the electron attachment enthalpy, because I'm starting here at the same place, infinity, if you will. And carbon is the smallest atom. So here's the uh, 
electron attachment enthalpy for carbon. Now they ask for the most negatives. That means the longest arrow that's going down because these are all negative. So the answer is going to be carbon has the most negative electron attachment enthalpy. Okay, now for D, place the three elements, boron, aluminum, and carbon in order of increasing first ionization energy. So ionization energy, we're looking at the opposite. So carbon, we're going to take an electron away, boron an electron away, and aluminum an electron away. So here, naturally, the closer it is to the nucleus, the harder it is to take. So carbon will have the greatest, then boron, then aluminum. Because remember, for ionization energy, you're taking the atom in the gas phase, you're adding the ionization energy, and then you're making uh, the cation, plus you're taking an electron away. An electron is closer to the nucleus, is harder to take. So here, the electron that you're taking away here is gonna be uh, from a closer, uh, closer to the nucleus than for boron because carbon has more protons than boron. Okay, so that's number 34. Okay, explain each answer briefly. Rank the following in order of increasing atomic radius. So here's oxygen, here's sulfur, and here's fluorine. So for A, we already know that lower period means more electrons and more shells, as it were. So sulfur is going to be the biggest. And then between oxygen and fluorine, oxygen and then fluorine, because here in the same period, fluorine has more protons in a nucleus pulling the electrons in. So what we've learned is that if you look at a period, their outermost shell is the same. If you look at two different periods, the lower one has a larger outermost shell. So we can do this fairly quickly without going through the electron configurations. If we just understand that in a group, we have more shells going down. And in a period, you have more protons going to the right. And if we really wanted to do this uh, so that it made more sense to us, we would say larger and larger because here fewer protons makes it larger. So here, now we have phosphorus, silicon. So here's phosphorus, here's silicon, here's sulfur. And where is selenium according to all of that? Selenium is down here underneath sulfur. So we got to say right off the bat that selenium is the biggest. And then between these, we're going to say phosphorus, then silicon, then sulfur, because farther to the right, it's going to be larger. Oh, they're not asking for uh, that. They're asking for ionization energy, but we can use the same thing, uh, which is going to have the largest ionization energy. So we can use the size here. So here's sulfur. Here's silicon, here's phosphorus, and here's selenium. So if we're gonna take an electron away, so here I'm taking the electron away to infinity, uh, which one's gonna be the hardest to take away? That's ionization energy. Well, the one that you had to put the most energy into, that, so that's sulfur. Okay, C, place the following in order of increasing radius. So for this one, we know that O2 minus has eight protons. Nitrogen has nine protons. Oh, excuse me, seven protons. And fluorine has, or fluoride has nine protons. Let me rewrite this. O two minus has eight protons. N three minus has seven protons. And fluoride has nine protons. Now, how many electrons does each of these have? 
Well, a neutral oxygen atom has eight protons, so an O2 minus has 10 electrons. A neutral nitrogen atom has seven protons, so a negative three nitride ion has 10 electrons. And this also has 10 electrons. So the question here is which one's going to be the smallest and the largest? We're supposed to put these in order of increasing radius. So which one will be the smallest? Uh, I gotta say it's gotta be the fluoride because they all have 10 electrons, but this has got nine protons so it can pull it in more tightly. So fluoride's gotta be the smallest, then oxide, then nitride. And then finally, for letter D, place the following in order of increasing ionization energy. So we want to go from small to large. So on our periodic table, we've got cesium, strontium, and barium. So they look like this, cesium, strontium, and barium. So clearly, the largest one has to be strontium because it's uh, farther up on the periodic table. So that means you're taking an electron that's closer to the nucleus. And then here, since uh, that's gonna be the largest, here, since barium is smaller, you're gonna be taking an electron that's closer to the nucleus than cesium. So then it's gonna be barium and then cesium. Okay, so there we go. Okay, 38, we're gonna skip because we're supposed to look in the book and I don't want to do that. 40, sketch the major features, number of peaks and relative intensities for each peak of the expected photoelectron spectrum for atoms of nitrogen. Uh, you won't see a question like this on the exam. Uh, I did talk about this a little bit in one of the other lectures or Q and A's, but I wouldn't worry about this. You won't see that question on the exam. Okay. The deep blue color of sapphires come from the presence of iron two and titanium four and solid aluminum oxide. Use an SPDF notation with a noble gas notation. Write the electron configurations of each of these ions. So how do we get the electron configuration of these ions? They're cations. Start with a neutral atom then take away electrons. So neutral atom, rearrange then take away electrons. So for iron, we're gonna start off with a noble gas of argon. And then we're gonna say 4s2, 3d6. And then we rearrange. So we get argon, 3d6, 4s2. And then for iron plus two, we're gonna go with argon, 3d6. We're gonna take away those two. Now this does say to write the SPDF and noble gas and we're done. Now it did not ask for noble gas and orbital box. So this is the answer right here. Now for titanium, we're gonna go with argon. And let's see, it's gonna be 4S2, 3D2. We're gonna rearrange it and get argon four, excuse me, 3D2, 4S2. And then we're gonna take away four electrons for titanium plus four. So it's gonna be argon. And what we really should do is write this as neon 3S2, 3P6. Okay, so there's your answer there for titanium plus four. Uh, what's the magnetism for these ions? Uh, and the answer here, this one is going to be diamagnetic. And this one is going to be paramagnetic. And you might wonder, well, how can I answer that so quickly without knowing what the box diagram looks like? And the answer is simple. Every electron will be paired if the subshell is full. An S subshell can have two electrons, a P can have six, a D can have 10, and an F can have 14. Here, this D can have 10 electrons in it. So when we put those 10 electrons in it, what is Hun's rule? 
one per orbital before you pair them. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you can see we end up with four unpaired electrons, paramagnetic. Here, uh, oops, I made a mistake here. No, I didn't make a mistake. Uh, here, if you look at the 3s, they're paired. And if you look at the 3p, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you always want to get into the habit when you're putting them into the orbitals and the subshells is to put them one per before you pair them. It would be too easy to take these six and put a pair, pair, and a pair, and it would be wrong. Okay, so that's number 42. The rare earth uh, elements or lanthanides exist as plus three ions. Use an orbital box diagram and noble gas notation. Show the electron configurations of the following elements and ions. So here we're going to have to show the orbital box diagram. So let's get cerium. Uh, cerium is number 58. So it's way down here on the periodic table. So if we go backwards from 58, 57, 56, 55, we start here at xenon 54. So here's cerium, xenon. And then after xenon, so here's xenon way over here in period five, we jump down to period six and we say, okay, 6s2, 5d1 for lanthanum. So 6 S2, 5D1, and then to get to cerium, it's down here, and that's a 4F1. Okay, so that's cerium, and now we need to rearrange this, and we get xenon, 4F1, 5D1, 6S2. Now, what does cerium plus three look like? Well, it's going to be look like xenon, 4F1, we're gonna take those three away. Okay, now kind of a quick way to check to see if you're close to being correct with this electron configuration is count electrons. Cerium is number 58, so it should have 58 electrons. And here xenon is number 54, so we got 54 electrons for that, plus one for the 4F, plus one for the 5D, plus two, for the uh, 6s, and when we add this all up together, we get four plus 54, which is 58. So at least the number of electrons matches. So uh, that makes us feel like this electron configuration is at least kind of closer or close to what it should be. So for A, we have uh, the, the box notations. So I didn't do the box notations yet. So I'm gonna do that now. Here's xenon. Now, for 4F, there are seven orbitals. So here's one, three more, and three more. And this is what it looks like for the 4F. For the 5D, there are five orbitals. And for the 6S, there's only one orbital. Now for cerium three plus, we're gonna write xenon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it'll look like that. So you might ask the question, do I have to write all of these orbitals when they're empty? And the answer is if there's one electron in the subshell, you need to write all the orbitals of that subshell. That's all there is to it. Okay. So for B, we're gonna look at holmium and holmium plus three. So for B, we're looking at holmium. Now, where is holmium? You see it's right here. It's down in the F block. So number 67 says that we're gonna start with not radon, which is 86. We're gonna start with xenon, which is 54. So for holonium, we start with xenon. And then when we continue, we can see that after 54, we have 55 and 56. This is 6s2. And then we go to number 57, which is, which is lanthanum. 
3D, 4D, 5D, so 5D1. And then for holmium, we have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 elements across to get to holmium. So that's going to be 4F10 because the moat is 4F then 5F. Okay. So that's holmium. Now we have to rearrange it. So we write xenon 4F10, 5D1, 6S2. And I'm going to go ahead and write the box notation for holmium. Xenon. So there's one. And it's 4F10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And 5D1. So 5D1, boom, 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 5D1, and 6S2. Now, holmium plus 3 is going to be xenon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine, 10, because it's still going to be 4F10. And we're going to take away these three electrons, one, two, three. So that's holmium with a plus three charge. So 4F10, because we take away those three electrons so that we end up with a plus three charge. Okay, so that's number 44. Uh, 46, an element 109 now named uh, mitnerium was produced blah, 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 depict its electron configuration using SPDF and noble gas. Okay, so this is element 109. So we're gonna start with a noble gas that is closest to 109, but smaller than 109. So it looks like we're gonna start with radon. So we're gonna start with radon, which is Rn. So mitnerium 109, Mt. We're gonna start with radon. And here we can see that here is uh, mitnerium. And so we started with number 86 radon. So we're going to go 7s2, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s. And then to get to mitnerium, you can see that we've got to go across the D block, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I'm going to write uh, 3d, 4d, 5d, 6d. I'm going to write 6d7. So 7s2, 6d7. But remember, there's actually a break here between actinium and mitnerium where we actually have to go down here from 89 to 90. So we have to go through all of these to 103 to come back up to rutherfordium and get to mitnerium. So we've got to include all these guys down here, which is going to be not 4F, but 5F, 5F14. Okay, so when I rewrite this, it's going to be radon 5F14, 6D7, 7S2. And there it is. So I'd expect that as your answer. Okay. So for this one, it's a little bit more practice for um, writing possible quantum numbers. So a possible excited state for the hydrogen atom has an electron in a 4p orbital. 4p orbital. Write a 
list all possible sets of quantum numbers for this. So we're going to go n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. So if it's a 4p, then n is equal to 4. And remember, for s, p, d, f, it's 0, 1, 2, 3. So if they say 4p, l is equal to 1. Now, what can m sub l equal if l is equal to 1? Well, it can be negative 1. And what can m sub s equal? Plus 1 half. Now you can also have a four, one, negative one, minus one half. So those are both possible sets of uh, electrons in a, a four P subshell. But you could also have a four, one, zero, plus one half, and a four, one, zero, minus one half. And you could have a four, one, plus one, plus one half, and a four, one, plus one, minus one half. So what are these electrons? Well, if you look at them, here's one up and one down. One of these is a four, one, we'll call it negative one, plus one half. And the other one is a four, one, negative one, minus one half. So what about here? Well, one of these is gonna be a four, one, zero, plus one half, and the other one will be a four, one, zero, minus one half. Now, what about the other? So this is the X and the Y. There's also a Z uh, orbital with two electrons in it. One of these is gonna be a four, one, plus one, plus one half, and a four, one, plus one, minus one half. So that's what we're looking at for the all of the possible sets of quantum numbers. Each one of these represents a different electron in the 4p subshell. Fifty refer to the book. Uh, Fifty-two rank the following. We're going to call it quits right now because I've been at it for about an hour. So uh, I'll start with fifty-two for my next uh, lecture. Thank you for listening. I should say my next Q&A.